Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm not replacing Brother Jeff. I'm just subbing for him. He asked me to kind of help him out while uh, the other sister that teaches the Sunday School or helps teach Sunday School, she's doing something else, so he asked me to kind of help out, and I agreed to do that. So, uh, But I need your all's prayers this morning because I don't know everything, so we're going to learn together. Amen? Thank God for his grace and mercies this morning that he can help us come together and learn together from his word. Amen? Anyone have a prayer request that you want to give in this morning? We'll start with prayer, and then we'll go into our lesson. Amen. Anyone else have a special prayer request before we pray? Just remember this. Remember Sister Kay. Anyone else? Okay, let's all go to the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this blessed day that you have given us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that this is the day that you have made and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing and answering prayers for your miracle work and healing, delivering power. And Lord Jesus, as we come before you this morning with these requests and needs, we know, Lord, that you're able to meet every need and every request, that there's nothing too hard for you to do this morning. And Lord, we bind together in one mind and one accord today, asking you to meet these needs and these requests. Touch Sister Kay as she goes for her surgery. Lord, that you would lead and guide and direct the hands of the doctors and bring her through this safely. Lord, touch Lisa's sister as she has surgery tomorrow. Lord, that, that everything will turn out well for her. Touch Sister Lisa's sick body this morning. Bring healing to her sick body. Every need and every request be met, dear Lord, through and by you, Heavenly Father. Help us today as we go to your word to learn and to hear and to receive from your word today. And we thank you and praise you for it, Father, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson today, Jesus confronts religious leaders. And I'm going to go ahead and just um, read all the scriptures, and then we'll go back and talk about them. And if anybody has a comment, question, something you want to add, we'll, we'll have time to do that too, hopefully. St. Mark chapter 2 and starting in verse 3. It says, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? But yet you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And it came to pass that as Jesus said at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with the publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began. 
as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why doth they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and did eat the shoe bread which is not lawful to eat but for the priest and gave also them which were with him and he said unto them the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath therefore the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath and the title of the lesson today is Jesus confronts religious leaders Jesus confronted errors and legalism with authority. It says Jesus was opposed by many of the religious leaders of the Jews. This brought him into frequent conflict with these religious leaders. Although his teaching, preaching, and conduct were never in violation of the law of Moses, however, in his teaching, preaching, and ministry, Jesus did violate the man-made rules and traditions of the religious leaders that made the word of God of none effect, and that was Mark 7 and 13. This angered Jesus' religious opponents to the point that they became determined to kill him, John 11, 47, 53. This lesson brings into focus some of the conflicts Jesus had with the religious leaders who opposed him and tells how he handled these conflicts. Jesus established his authority during his earthly ministry by the life he lived and work he did. There was a sense in which Christ inherited the king by identifying himself with the house of David and with the tribe of Judah in the nation of Israel. However, such connections by no means completely explain his power and authority. His authority was derived, his majesty undefiable and his glory undeterminable on the basis of the world's standards. Jesus Christ was a divinely appointed king. He introduced a new mystery into the kingship by yielding authority over unseen powers. He introduced a new mastery into kingship by nominating by dominating the spiritual, material, physical, social, and moral realms. Along with this, he introduced into the new world a ministry of mercy and meditation for the needs of humankind. A further distinction of his supreme authority lies in the fact that ever abiding Christ knows no successor or superior, and there can never be an upspur to undermine his throne of righteousness. His credentials as a ruler are complete, his competence as a per king is perfect, and his capabilities as governor are of the highest caliber. However, the religious leaders of the first century questioned and fought against Jesus' authority. But, as we will see in today's lessons, their efforts to hold on to religious power by exerting their self-made, self-mode legalism, power, Help hapless against the king of kings. Okay. Mark 2 and 6 through 7. We'll go back and read that and then we'll have some discussion about it. It says, And they came to him, came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was the born of four. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Now, we know that the scribes were men who studied the law. They were really intelligent people. But I heard somebody say a long time ago, a minister say some time, a long time ago, that we can be sincere and be sincerely wrong about something and I think that's what these people were they were sincere in their study and of the laws but they were sincerely wrong about some of it weren't they and uh, about it, how the laws were it says uh, accepting the law as the basis for regulation of all life 
They made it their primary task to study, to interpret and expound the law. But they added to it actual requirements less loading the people with burdens grievous to be borne. So they put so much more on the people than was actually needed that they couldn't even keep up. They couldn't keep all of it. And that's not what that's not what it's about, is it? It's not what God asked us to do. He asked us to live by his word, not to add anything or take anything away, but to live by his word. And it he's he said in his word for us in Matthew chapter St. Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse 11, 28, 29, and 30, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Does that sound like somebody that wants us to be under such a burden with trying to keep rules and regulations? It doesn't sound like it to me. It sounds like he wants us to, yes, keep his, his word and do what his word says, but don't add anything to it to make it different than what it really means for us to do. He said his yoke was easy and his burden was light. So that's good news for us today, isn't it? That we're not under that law. Amen? We're not under law. We're under grace today. And I'm so thankful that we are, ain't you? I'm thankful that we're not under law, that we're under God's grace today. We need it. Amen? Well, let's go back to our scriptures. After several weeks of intensive evangelism, Jesus and his disciples needed rest. They returned to their headquarters in the fishing town of Capernaum. The news of his coming spread rapidly because life in Palestine was very public and an open door meant an open invitation for anyone to enter. When it became known that Jesus was in town, the people came from every part of the city. The poor sufferers hobbled and crawled to Jesus' place of rest. Others were carried to him by compassionate friends. They crowded into the courtyard and filled the narrow vestibule and crammed the street outside the house. Wouldn't it be wonderful if on Sunday morning, if people nowadays were like they were then, that they crowded into the house of God to hear God's word and, and see what God was going to do? Wouldn't it be wonderful? This is an open door policy. You know, the doors are open to anyone who wants to come, just like they were there. That It was an open door. You can come if you want to, and that's the way it is here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people crowded in and were standing outside around the church to hear God's word and see what God was going to do? Amen? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Why were the people there? Undoubtedly, many of them had hungry hearts. Would we come with hungry hearts? to hear and to receive from God today. Amen? Just like they were. They were there because they needed help. Others were there because of curiosity. They saw a great throng of people and wanted to see what was happening. The critics were there also, including the scribes and doctors of the law. They were determined to find something they could use to discredit Jesus. It was under these circumstances that a palsy-stricken man was brought to Jesus. The term palsy was used by ancient doctors to include catalepsy or tetanus. Some think it might have been spinal meningitis. If this was a cataleptic form of the disease, the limbs and head became immovable. The victim suffered excruciating ag agony when he was moved or touched. Mark indicates that he was carried by four men. The, men was lying, the man was lying on a thin mattress, and each of the men held one corner and carried the sick man to Jesus. Arriving at the house where Jesus was preaching, they discovered it was impossible to get through the crowd. 
Being men of resourcefulness, however, they uncovered the roof and lowered the man into the presence of Jesus. The faith of the four men was proved by their zeal in overcoming obstacles. The sick man's faith seems to have especially pleasing to Jesus. It is significant that Jesus announced the forgiveness of the man's sin rather than the healing of his disease. This was because Jesus knew sin is the fundamental problem of humankind. How could Jesus see the four men's faith and why is it important was one of the questions here. Anybody want to answer? How could Jesus see the four men's faith and why is this important? Why do you all think they, why, why could he see their, their faith? Right, right. They put their faith into action. They seen the big crowd. They couldn't get through the big crowd because they had this man lying on a mattress trying to carry him around, so they couldn't get through the crowd. But, but they didn't look at the crowd and say, well, you're not going to get healed today because we can't get you close enough to Jesus to be healed. No, they went on top of the roof and peeled the roof back and let the man down in front of Jesus so that the man would be healed. I mean, why is it important? Because, like Sister Ruth said, we got to put our faith into action sometimes, don't we? We pray about things, but sometimes God requires us to also do something. So we put it into action, just like these men did. They had faith. They obviously believed that this man was going to be healed because they went far enough to go up on the roof and peel the roof back and put him down in front of Jesus, so they obviously had enough faith to believe that this man was going to be, going to be healed. And uh, by doing that, as Sister Ruth says, they put their faith in action. Anybody else have a comment, question? Okay, going on to verse 6 and 7. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man... Thus speak blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God only? Blasphemy is any speech contrary to the honor of God. This offense was punishable by death. While Jesus had not said he could forgive sins, he implied as much by declaring the authority that the palsied man's sins were forgiven. In making this claim, he assumed a divine prerogative. How were the scribes wrong in their reasoning, and how were they correct? Anybody got a thought on that? How were the scribes wrong in their reasoning, and how were they correct? Help me out. This requires class participation. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Nobody's got anything. Okay, we're going to move on then. The powerful healer, Mark 2, 8 through 12. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. The scribes were ready to launch a public attack against Jesus. However, Jesus understood their motives. Therefore, he presented a challenge to them. Whatever is, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, the sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk? Undoubtedly, the reason Jesus used this approach was because this sick man was a, seen as a sinful man. Then, too, any charlatan could say, Your sins are forgiven. The kind of statement was uncheckable. 
however to say, get up and walk, could either be proved or disproved immediately. In effect, Jesus was saying, You declare that I have no right to forgive sins? You believe that if this man is sick, he is a sinner, and that he cannot be cured until he, he is forgiven? Watch this. Jesus spoke the word, and the man was healed according to their own beliefs. The man could not be could not be uh, unless he was first forgiven. He was cured, therefore he was forgiven. This experience baffled the scribes. They were legal experts, but here was an upstart making them look foolish in public. Something must be done. Eventually something would be done. In fact, in this incident, Jesus signed his death warrant. Jesus is God's future in, the, in person. That is what his healings announced to in, encounter Jesus was to encounter God's rule in human form. So Jesus went throughout Galilee heralding that God was taking the throne and his healing ministry pointed, pointed that out, that he was healing. So that was verse... Mark 8 through 12. We're going to go on now to St. Mark 15 and 16. Eating with sinners. And it came to pass that as Jesus said at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it? that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. After becoming a follower of Jesus, Matthew did not immediately cut himself off his, his old acquaintances and friends. And of course, Matthew was a tax collector. Instead, he went to great effort to introduce them to Jesus. Inviting Jesus to a banquet was the logical method of bringing them into contact with the Master. Perhaps this was a way of saying farewell to his old life. Another possibility is that this dinner occurred long after Matthew left his tax collecting booth to follow Jesus. If so, this shows Matthew's desire for his friends to meet Jesus was a sustained desire. The Pharisees so despised the tax collectors that without even thinking, they lumped them together with sinners. The accusers of Jesus in this passage considered a sinner to be anyone who did not agree with every detail of their contentious scrupulousness. When Jesus mingled with the sinners, he never sacrificed his principles. Paul encouraged believers to take opportunities to dine with unbelievers, a means of perhaps reaching them for Christ. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Conscience, 1 Corinthians 10, 27. Okay, we're going to move on to Mark 2 and 17. It says, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So how could Jesus call sinners to repentance if he didn't go where they were? He had to be around them, just like we do. We have to, we're in this world, but not of this world. Is that not what the Bible says? So we have to be around people that are sinners, to reach sinners. It doesn't mean that you have to do what they do or act like they act, but we also don't want them to feel like we are portraying that we're better than they are. They don't want somebody that's got a self-righteous attitude in front of them making them think that you're better than they are because that's not going to reach them. How are we going to reach sinners if we're not out amongst them like Jesus was? And 
again, not a self-righteous attitude, but in a loving, kind way. And you may not have to say anything to them. Maybe you, you know, at your work, you may work with people, and I'm sure a lot of us do, work with people that are lost. We may not have to say anything to them, but it may be the life that we live before them. Just like, you know, Jesus lived the life in front of these people. And he didn't, you know, act like he was better than they was. He'd come in and eat with them. You know, uh, not, but, but not sacrificing of who he was. You know, of not, uh, for lack of a better word, not acting like they act, okay? But, but being a light and a witness and an example, like we're supposed to be, a light, a witness, an example to others, per portraying Christ in front of others. Uh, you know the old saying, you may be the only Bible that anyone ever reads. Has anybody ever heard that? A lot of us have heard that. So we can be that light and witness in our day-to-day -day life, can't we? The people that we meet and come in contact with, how we act and how we react makes a big difference, doesn't it? Because people are watching. They're looking at us. You say you're a Christian. Well, how are you going to act or how are you going to react to this situation? Anybody ever found themselves in that situation? Amen? We're, we're all still human and we're still in the flesh, aren't we? And we have to... Uh, have God's grace and mercy to help us because sometimes we run into situations where uh, we may be angry about a situation or upset about a situation. So we have to be really careful how we act and react in that situation so that we don't cause someone not to come to Christ. Amen? Anybody got a comment or question? We, we're going to camp on this for just a minute. Anybody? Anybody ever been in that situation? You want to tell of a little experience you've had in that situation? So as again, we're 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 still in the flesh, and we still have fleshly feelings, and and uh, so we still get angry, don't we? But we have to, by God's grace and help, try to not let that anger get out of control, and do something or say something that would hurt someone or cause someone not to come to Jesus because of the way that we acted or reacted. Amen. All right, going on. Mark two seventeen. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus compares healing physical ailments and healing sinners of their sin. This echoes Isaiah's prophecy about him in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. And I thought I wrote that down, but maybe I didn't. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Peter also wrote of the master's dual healing touch. 
he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 2.24 The sinful need the healing that mercy and forgiveness bring as much as the sick need a doctor. The Pharisees completely miscomprehended the purpose of Christ's mission. They had believed the Messiah was obliterate, sinful people and elevate the righteous. Of course, they saw themselves in the latter role. They had little use for the one who received, forgave, and transformed the sinner while dismissing the self-righteous as hypocrites. And we know uh, in the scripture that, that Jesus did not have very much good to say to the Pharisees, did he? He did not have uh, so but he said they had little use for the one who received, forgave, and transformed sinners. So they had kind of a the Pharisees had a, a self righteous attitude, didn't they? One thing I read uh, the Jewish historian said about the Pharisees, a body of Jews who professed to be the religious better than the rest but they weren't they just professed that they were so that self-righteous attitude got them in trouble didn't it okay moving on does anybody have any comments questions anything you want to say before we go to the next scripture mark 2 18 through 22 and jesus said unto them can the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, as long as they have a bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they shall fast in those days. I'm sorry. I didn't, that's not where I wanted to go. Okay, let's go to Mark 2, 23 and 24, the Pharisees' question. And it came to pass that when... They went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? No feature of the Jewish system was marked as its extraordinary strictness in the outward observance of the Sabbath as a day of complete rest. The scribes had elaborated from the command of Moses a vast array of prohibitions and injunctions. For example, the quantity of items that might be carried on the Sabbath from one place to another was duly settled. It must be less in bulk than a dried fig, if honey, only as much as would anoint a wound, if ink, as much as would form two letters, all food must be prepared, all vessels washed, and all lights kindled before sunset. On this occasion, however, Jesus sanctioned two offenses against overtly strict Sabbath laws. The plucking of the ears was a kind of reaping, and the rubbing was a kind of grinding and threshing. Why do some religious groups impose harsh interpretation of God's laws? Anybody got a comment on that? Why do you all think that? Why do you all think that some religious groups impose harsh interpretation of God's laws? Did they want it to suit themselves? Anybody got a comment? Do you think they've done it to suit themselves? Yeah, it elevates them. Yeah, control. Oh, my goodness. But we're, we're, we're under God's control, aren't we? 
Amen. As his children, we're under his control. Okay, the Lord answers in Mark 2, 25 through 28. It says, As he said unto them, Have you never read what David said when he had need and was a hungered, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest, and did eat the shewbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. Jesus' reply to the Pharisees' criticism was ironic. In all your study of the letters of the scriptures, did you never take heed to what David did? He reminded them that when David was fleeing from King Saul, he entered the tabernacle and collected holy bread for himself and his hungry men, even though it was not lawful for anyone except the priest to eat it. And that's 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6 and Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. Though this was probably an incident, a Sabbath breaking, Jesus used this occasion to set aside ceremonial law for a good and sufficient reason. Then Jesus made his great pronouncement about the use of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It is given to people as a privilege, not as a burden. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, that is, if I permit my disciples to pluck ears of grain on the Sabbath, you have no right to condemn them. Whatever meets the Lord's approval is right for the day. The Lordship of Jesus. We have come to worship things, status, fame, popularity, money, and security. Anything that comes between God and ourselves is idolatry. Jesus demands lordship over all such things. And that was a quote from Billy Graham. Does anyone else have a comment or question about our lesson today? We're getting ready to, to wind up here. Mm -hmm. But they was just... You know, the scribes and Pharisees were just trying to put so many uh, restrictions on them that they just, they weren't able to do it all because they were so harsh and so restricted. Yeah, it's different. Their calendar, yeah, their calendar is different than ours. Right. Just a lot of things that didn't have anything to do with really what God wanted, wasn't it? Just a lot of rules that didn't have anything to do with what God really wants. Right, instead of relationship, it's about keeping laws or rules. But that's not what God's about, is it? God's about relationship, in me. And it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to keep his word because we are. But it's about our relationship with him. Amen. Love triumphs legalism. When Jesus Christ lived on earth, his enemies continually confronted him on religious matters. In today's lesson, we saw how they questioned his authority regarding healing 
forgiveness, fasting, and the Sabbath because it threatened their legalistic interpretations of the Scripture. Today, it is critically important that we as Christians know, believe, and obey the teaching of God's Word. This will regard us against legalism, religious rules, and regulations not found in Scripture. This will also guard us against license of selfish, unholy living that ignores the biblical standards God has given us to live by. Amen. Thank you all for your participation today and for helping us with our lesson. And I hope that we all got something from the lesson today. Thank you all very much. Welcome this morning. I want to welcome everybody that's come out and good to see each one of you and uh, good to see some faces we haven't seen for a while. Good to see Sister Bird back with us and her and Teresa and Avery Gerald. It's good to see them back. Eh? Let's give them a hand. <laughs> now we've missed Granny Bird. She's such a fixture around here and we really missed her. Glad to have her back. And we are just glad to have each one of you. We've got other visitors. We'll extend special welcome to each one of you. And good to have you here. And just get in and enjoy the service here at worship. Our revival starts this morning. Uh, and I don't see Brother John here just yet, but he'll be here shortly, I'm sure. And he always does. He's on his way. So he'll be here directly. Yep. Yeah. That's the main thing, ain't it? Jesus is here. That's what we're here for, worship and lift up his name and glorify him. Uh, I just want a uh, quick reminder, too. Uh, next Sunday, chili cook-off. If you haven't signed up, why, be, uh, you don't have to sign up, but we, if you, we'd really rather you could, so we'll have, kind of have an idea who all's uh, cooking. And uh, we've got a sign-up sheet back there. And also still need... Uh, Still need some all the supplies and goodies that goes with the chili. So 
still got a lot of spaces back there, and if you have it signed up to volunteer to bring some stuff, well, be deeply appreciated. This goes to the youth. It really helps them out, uh, and they got a lot of activities, and uh, and uh, I always go with the, uh, well, I can't even think of it, where they go to uh, in spring of the year. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> When you get older, your mind kind of goes blank sometimes, but uh, it, it really helps them out. And if you haven't seen the the room since they've uh, redone it, they spent a lot of work. It's really neat. And if you ain't walked back there, uh, after church, if you walk back there, it's over here on the left-hand side back here. And just go back, and uh, they've redone it, and it looks really nice. And just go back there and see all the hard work they've done on it. Okay, we're going to turn it over to a pastor. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. And if you failed to wear blue today, you're not part of the blue brigade. But good to see the blue brigade. Granny Bird, welcome back home. And your seat is still there. It's still there. To God be the glory. Brother John is on his way. He called a while ago. Uh, Pam is with him. Uh, but this morning she is not feeling well and uh, her leg is swelled up a little bit so she's going to rest in the motel room. But John is on his way. But Jesus is here. He is with us. He came with us. He was in this room before we got here. And to God be the glory. I love the Lord, don't you? Hey, Sister Cornette's back too. She's got on blue. <laughs> Thank you for your prayers. Her mouth's still a little sore, uh, but uh, she's here. It's long to be here. Please understand that several weeks my, our, my mom was with us staying in her home in Richmond, and we chose not to bring her here but keep her kind of there safe. So Darlene had to be away and was not able to be here uh, after Christmas like she would have liked to. But you all understood that, and... Mom, hey, 93 in, in about a month. March the 8th, my mom will be 93, COVID-free. Never has been sick, and to God be the glory for that, and I'm grateful for that. But, hey, we've got a lot in here that's had it, and you're alive and well and doing great. We ought to just thank the Lord for his healing power. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. By his stripe, we are healed. We want to welcome our uh, Facebook live stream family and friends and later on the um, uh, YouTube uh, channel family and friends will join us uh, that usually comes on YouTube after the service let's stand and we want to go to the Lord in prayer today God has a plan for this revival God has a purpose for everyone and the Holy Ghost is not limited in what he's able to do, not only in this room here, but across the airwaves. We want the Lord to have his way. What has been our theme through this 21 days of fasting and prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let us set our hearts upon Jesus today. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace and love. Thank you for your goodness, your power, and your might. And Lord, we come into this room today and those that join us across the airwaves today, Lord, through the Internet, we come to you lifting up the name of Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Lord, bless Brother John today. Bless every heart and life. Bless the children in their children's church, Lord. God, we pray for your power and your might, your spirit to be all over this place, Lord. Do the work you have chosen to do. Holy Ghost, have your way. We're here to obey in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Remain standing. Let's give the Lord another praise. He is worthy. Let's worship the Lord in song. So good to see everybody here this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Help us sing nothing but the blood. What? can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the
See, Brother John made it this morning. Yeah. Been looking forward to seeing him come. Just really glad he's here. Going to take up a prayer request this morning, and if you got a need, we want to pray for it. Just continue to remember Paul, and uh, he wanting he wanting to come, but he's still just a little afraid to. But can any hold him up in prayer? And, I remember my granddaughter got uh, granddaughter Beth. Just uh, she really needs a deliverance and a touch, and just remember her in prayer. Do you have any other request? Okay. 
Okay, remember Gerald Popway, remember this. He has Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, if I didn't have them, I sure wouldn't want them. I, I, we love praise reports. If you got a praise report, we're always got time for it. Okay, amen. <laughs> Others this morning. Okay, okay remember this. Others. Okay, remember Michaela. Remember her. Okay, okay, remember Birdie and Steve. I didn't remember them. Okay. Others? Okay. Remember this. Okay. Any others? Okay, let's all stand and just take key before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning. Just thank you, Lord. Lord, just to be here, to be in good health. Lord, that we can be here and enjoy your word. Lord, Lord, we pray we hide your word in our hearts this morning. Lord, we come to you on behalf of this precious request. Lord, we pray for each one, pray for us. morning and and we are still continue taking our first fruits we're going to continue to take it through the month of february and uh, if you haven't uh, gave gave yet uh, just there's still plenty of time uh we do ask that you either use a envelope mark on it world missions and your first fruits and also or if you write a check so it kind of div eventuate between them but then uh, of course we're still and we're going to take care of Brother John, too. He's, he pours his heart out, so we want to.
take care of him there in this revival also. Brother Philip, we're going to ask you to pray the blessing over the offering. Yeah, we're just going to ask you to bring your offering up and... Uh... that amen <laughs> amen uh lee if there's some point uh during the singing you could post our mailing address for those that wish to mail their tithes and offerings and first fruit offerings in <clears throat> we can post that and uh, throughout the week <clears throat> while we're taking the offering we just post our address 241 stevens ridge road rich russell springs kentucky 42642 and that will take care of it. Thank you for your support. Uh, this revival, we're recording every sermon, and there is a sign-up list at the booth. Uh, go back, and or will, will it be out in the Welcome Center? Oh, it'll be at the booth, and if you would like to uh, go ahead and order your CDs of every sermon, uh, every service, then uh, they will be able to get those recorded ahead of time for you you can collect at the end of the revival god is up to something big his power and his might have not abated he has not lost his authority he is on the throne of glory and he is in charge of this universe if you have a loved one that needs deliverance Get them into this house. Get them in here to hear the Word of God and be set free from the power and the bondage of the devil. If you've got a loved one that's lost, plead with them. Honey, come with me. Just come. Come one night of the service. Come in the name of the Lord. And if there's any in this room today, you don't know Jesus my friend, you don't realize how much Jesus loves you and He wants to know you. Give your life to the Lord. This altar is open at any time. Any time. And you come and give your life to Jesus. We'll stop and pray with you. Amen. He's in the delivering business. No matter what your past, it's about your future that really counts. Amen. Amen. Let's give the praise team a big hand as they come. After that, Brother John will preach, and the children's uh, ministries will be dismissed to their classes. Let's all stand and worship the Lord. There is 
How many are glad to be in the house of God this morning? 
I don't know if, if the church is shut here in Kentucky, but I know they shut for about two months in Alabama, and they shut for about three or four months in parts of Tennessee and Georgia and Florida and other states, and I had a lot of time to talk to the Lord and find out what he has to say about COVID-19 and what he has to say about what's going on in our country right now. How many are just a little concerned about our spiritual direction as a nation? Let me see your hands right now. That doesn't mean you're not a good American. That doesn't mean you're not going to pray for the president-elect or the president. It doesn't mean that you're not going to pray and pray that he makes good godly decisions. It doesn't mean that you love God any less or your country any less. It means that you see certain things. You see certain things that you know that God can't approve of. You see things like abortion in our country. Uh, that's an abomination. If killing innocent babies is not an abomination, then I don't think there's an abomination that exists. And, 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 and I have a very checkered past, and I'm going to share some of that this morning. And, I, and this isn't being negative. This is being real. This is about the importance of revival and it, I told my wife, I said, you can't wait to meet everybody at Bernard Ridge. And my wife has this thing. She thinks I'm getting older. I don't understand that. My hair's falling out. And it's, what's not falling out is turning white, but I don't feel older. But she thinks I'm getting older. And when she comes, she insists on driving. And about five years ago, she had a really bad accident and shattered her kneecap and Broke the bottom part of her leg severely, broke her ankle, broke her wrist, and um, she insists on driving when we're going to revival, and she's with me so that I can rest for revival, and I understand, but this morning she woke up, her leg was swollen, her knee was swollen, and I stuck it under her pillow, that's why I was running a little bit late, and, but she'll be with us tonight, either I'll carry in on my back or roll her in in a chair, and she can't wait to meet you. And I, she was asking me about you, and I said, well, they're a church that loves God. They love God's word. They're kind, and they're good, and, and, they, and they're loving, and they're Christ-like in how they treat others. And that's an understatement. But also, I believe you're a church, knowing your pastor and first lady, that has a mind and a heart for God. You realize that the future of our nation lies in what the churches of America do. Not just the Church of God, but Assemblies of God, the Baptists, the Catholics. We don't have any enemies. If they believe in Jesus and them, Him crucified, they may not speak in tongues like we do, but they're welcome. Let whomsoever will come and drink of the water of life freely. The Baptists are not my enemies. The, the Methodists are not my enemies. The Assemblies of God is not my enemy. The devil is our enemy, and he can defe be defeated when the church comes together. Now, I know it's hoiky joiky, but bear with me. I was seeking the Lord about this revival, and I'm going to tell you what he told me, and I'm going to pray right now real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I prayed this for weeks as I prepared for this meeting. I prayed, Lord God, when I was in Houston last week in revival, that you would stretch forth your mighty hand to heal that signs and wonders would be done in the name of the holy child Jesus, that there would be great grace and great power upon me, the speaker and the singers and the speakers this week, because we don't only need your power, we need a grace to deliver with mercy and love. And Father God, I pray desperately, I pray desperately that there will be a drawing to every altar and, Lord God, that there would be sinners in every service, Lord God. Normally, I designate certain nights for salvation night, but I believe we live in an hour that every night is salvation night, and there'll be a drawing to these altars. There will be a manifestation of your Holy Spirit upon these altars with signs following, confirming your word with signs following, Lord God. And I pray that you would anoint this vessel I am the least of your servants, but I am a servant of the Most High God. And you chose, God, to use earthen vessels. 
You could have used vessels of silver from a palace. You could have used vessels of gold from a palace, but you chose to use earthen vessels, frail and weak vessels to pour your anointing through so that all will know that you get all the glory for everything that happens, that I'm just a vessel that you're flowing through. But God, I pray especially this week that you will anoint my head with oil till my cup runneth over, that out of my belly will flow rivers of living water through my lips, producing life and health in every person that it touches, and that it becomes a fire shut up in our bones, and that our lives are transformed forever. And I ask this favor in the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and a shout of triumph. As I was preparing this morning, we got in and thank you for the beautiful motel room that you put us up in. You don't have to do that, but we're very grateful that you do and, and that you left some, a nice fruit basket and all kinds of goodies. And it's nice to walk in a room and uh, not to run out to a restaurant and just have goodies to eat. And thank you so very much for your sacrifice. And I love you like family. And when I told Pam the most about you, and you'll meet her tonight, and you'll see why I'm such a happy man, that uh, you're just wonderful. You're loving, and you're kind, and you're good, and you're gracious, and you, and you care, and you love God's Word, and you love the move of the Holy Ghost. And, and, and so I, I'm so excited to be with you because, guys, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about our nation I'm very concerned, not so much for me, you know, because I believe the Lord's coming back in my lifetime, but I've been preaching that for 40 years, and I believe He could come tonight. He could come right now. It, 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 you know, but but, but I'm, what I'm saying, should the Lord tarry 15, 20 years, I probably won't be around to worry about much of anything. And if I am, I might probably be at that age where I just don't care. But the point that I'm trying to make, I've got children and I got grandchildren and I want to leave them a better country than I inherited from my parents. We've got to turn this nation back to God. How many believe that America needs a Holy Ghost revival from coast to coast, border to border? Because when we have that, everything else will take care of itself. I want to say something right off the get-go so when we have the altar services, you're not nervous. I had COVID back in August. My wife also had it. I did not find out until um, after I recovered that I was one day, according to the doctors. I don't know how they can figure how many days, but I was from one day from being dead. And they gave me an injection of some kinds of steroids. It, all I can tell you is it felt like maple syrup going in through that needle and they gave me high doses of antibiotics and then a whole dose of a bunch of people praying. And I had, I had, had I was diagnosed with COVID on one day, had double COVID pneumonia the next day. But I want to tell you that I was told that I had it about as bad as you can get it and still live through it and get your health back. And I'm here to tell you, saints of God, that God heals COVID-19. God still heals. There's no disease he cannot heal. And I've learned through that that the fear of the pandemic can be worse than the pandemic itself. Because if you allow it to dominate everything, and I respect you, if you feel you need to wear a mask, I fully respect that. If you, when we have altar services and you may not want me to lay hands on your head, then just touch your shoulder and, and I'll lay hands on your shoulder. If you, and, I, and that doesn't mean you're not a good Christian. It doesn't mean you're weak in faith. That means that's what you feel comfortable with and I honor that and respect that. If you don't want me to lay hands on you at all, just point at me and I'll, I'll pray long distance for you and, and just point at you. But I'm telling you, saints of God, something has occurred to me. And I'm so proud of you for being in the house of God this morning. Because I, I refuse. Do you hear what I'm saying, beloved? I refuse to believe that God can protect me at Walmart. And God can protect me at the dollar store. 
But God can't protect me in the house of God. I refuse to believe this. Walmart's great. Dollar store's great. But this is the house of God. This is God's house. Now, are we going to do safety precautions? I noticed you got social distancing. I noticed that families are sitting together. But as far as washing your hands, I'm sixty, going to be 65 years old. And I remember coming to the table for breakfast and dinner and stuff and put my hands under my leg and stuff. My mama had eight kids, but she had x-ray vision. And she could tell if I had dirty nails. And she could tell if my hands were washed. So I've been washing my hands all my life. I, there's nothing new about that. And so saints of God, we take precautions. Wear a mask if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask. Uh, sanitize your hands if you feel more. Do all the stuff you feel comfortable in doing. But don't let the devil tell you that God cannot protect you from this thing because he can. He can stop you from getting it. And if you get it, he can heal you if you get it. Can I get a testimony? To, so, so, so we're concerned about our nation because of COVID. Then, of course, because of all the things that have changed because of COVID, some things, I think, are overreactions. Uh, but having said that, that's my view. But because of that, it's affecting the economics. It's affecting business. It's, it's affecting every aspect of life. And, then I, and not this church, but I've noticed that many churches and many Christians are bound by a spirit of fear and dread. And they wake up every morning with a fearfulness and a dreadfulness and the, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I've got nothing to fear about today. God's God today. God will be God tomorrow. He still saves. He still delivers. He still heals. He still does miracles. And I am so glad to be back with my family at Bernard Ridge. And I can't wait to Pam meets all of you. But having said that, I'm saying this. We're aware of the economic problems we're facing we're aware of the fact that there's a lot of political division in our nation right now. We're aware of the fact that the current president is making a couple decisions, and I'm not passing judgment. I'm just telling you the truth. It's bad enough that we pay for abortions in this country. Now we're going to pay for them all around the world to make it easier to have abortions around the world. There's no way that God can be pleased with that. There's no way that God could possibly bless that. He, but through his grace and mercy and for the remnant's sake, he's withheld this judgment because there's a remnant like you that are not doing those things. You're serving the Lord in holiness. And because of that, God honors it and he spares the rest for the remnant's sake. Somebody shout hallelujah. But I'm concerned and I want to see this nation Turn back to God. And I think when you hear what I'm going to preach today, you're going to understand where my heart comes from. I don't talk a lot about my past because I'd rather talk about what God has done in my life and our glorious future in him. Abundant life now, abundant life every day. Someone say abundant life every day and eternal life forever. I'm hearing from the Lord. It's flowing faster than I can think. So if I get stuttering or something, it's because the thoughts are coming faster than I can think. But having said that, I'm concerned about our future. And what, and, and, and what I'm about to share with you is not in any way to glorify my past. It's not in any way to make you feel like I'm proud of my past because I'm ashamed of what I was. I'm ashamed of the lifestyle I had lived. And I'm saying this because you may have loved ones that you want to bring to revival this week. And in the back of your mind, you said, I've tried everything and they're still not saved. I prayed, I fasted, I begged, I pleaded, and they're still not saved. Don't give up. Don't give up. I had a sister who was a prostitute. And after I got saved... I had been preaching for several years, and my sister, who had been a prostitute since she was 16 years old, she would call me up. She would call my house, talk to one of my kids, and trick them into giving her the phone number at the motel I was at in Revival. And she would call me up. 
she would be with one of her Johns. And she would describe to me on the phone in detail what they were doing. And I knew she was high on heroin. And I knew because the way heroin is, it's an uncontrollable drug that she could die before the night was over from an overdose. So I was afraid to hang up, you see. And I would listen to her tell me these things. And I'd want to go and find the man and kill him. And, of course, that wouldn't have changed her none. It broke my heart to think about my sister being abused and used in that way. And I would pray for her and pray for her and pray for her. And she, the more I prayed for her, the more frequent those phone calls came. And then I'd have to, and she'd do it right before church, and, and I'd have to go to church with that on my mind. It was not easy. And I want to share this with you because somebody here, I didn't plan it, has a loved one you think is really far from God, and they're a really hard case, and you really begin to wonder if they're ever going to get saved. And I went to church one Sunday when I was in a revival, and my pastor just preached a simple message how we had to have a burden for the lost loved ones in our family and how we needed to pray for our lost loved ones no matter how bad they were, reach out to and testify. And I remember, Brother Cornette, like it was yesterday. When the preacher got done preaching, I got up and started right for the back door. And I said to myself, I've prayed for Cookie till I've been blue in the face. I've listened to her vulgar phone calls. I've listened to all this stuff. I've prayed. I've fasted. And I ain't going to pray for her anymore because I done prayed all you can pray. I got about halfway to the back. And you know the voice of the Holy Ghost. And he spoke to me. And he said, John, if you don't pray for her, God knows, you see. He said, if you don't pray for her, There won't be anybody praying for her because nobody's praying for her anymore. If you don't pray for her. See, my parents weren't saved yet. There'd be nobody praying for her. I turned and hit that altar, and I squalled and bawled for about two hours, and I got up. And then about a week before that, I forgot I mailed her a a, a cassette. I'm going back a long way. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, the big square thing, whatever. I can't remember what you call them anymore. Well, I mailed her one of them great big things. And, and I was preaching for Dr. T.L. Lowry in Washington, D.C. An eight track right? No. Yeah, I mailed her the big square thing. And I said, why am I mailing this to my sister as a prostitute who mocks me, makes fun of me, torments me? What in the world am I doing this for? But I did it. And one, I, one night after God had me pray that prayer, my phone rings. I'm in revival. A couple weeks after that night, I prayed. And it was my sister on the phone. I said, oh, boy, here we go again. And what happened was that my sister had a, another prostitute that they would do special tricks for. I won't go into it that they would just do it together. And, and I'm not being vulgar. Please don't be offended. I, it's just the truth. And the woman she was about to go have an appointment with a John with happened to stick it in the TV set. A black lady. And she was watching and she looked over at my sister and said, who's that man preaching there? She said, that's my brother Johnny. And that black lady looked at my sister and she said, if I had a brother like that, I wouldn't be living like this. And my sister called me on the phone and gave her life to Jesus Christ that night. So don't give up on praying for your lost loved ones. And two of her daughters already were in the business. They got saved. Her son was in Joliet State Penitentiary for manslaughter. He got saved and is now preaching the gospel. That's the kind of revival God's going to give us this week. He's going to save the hard cases. He's going to save the difficult cases. If you can just get him here, 
what I'm trying to say. I grew up in the city of Chicago, and I know it's kind of hicky joicky, but it, it's going to tie right into the message. I'm not proud of it. I don't know if how many of you have ever seen just even a little bit of the TV show Chicago PD. Anybody besides me? Let me see your hand. And, and if you've ever seen any of that show, that's pretty much the way it is. Only they cleaned it up a lot for that show. It's a lot worse than that. And so that was the environment, those streets, the, the crimes that they deal with on that show. That was the world. That was my playground. That's how I grew up. And I've watched segments of it with my wife for a little bit just to show her. I said, you see those viaducts? You see those abandoned buildings? You see those junkyards? That's where I played as a little kid. That's where I hung out at five, six, seven years old. That was my playground, not a swing set, some old dilapidated condemned building and in really bad neighborhood, drug pushers on every corner, game bangers everywhere. At the age of eight, I joined a street gang, the Vice Lords, the largest white gang in the city of Chicago. Two of my brothers were already in the game before me. My brother at that time was the warlord, the second highest member of the gang. I'm not proud of that. I'm ashamed of that. It's at that same time of my life at eight years old, I started smoking cigarettes when I was five. I'm ashamed of that. But they were readily available with the people I hung around with. And I was polishing shoes in bars because even, I'm not a cute person, I'm not a good looking guy, but even me at six years old, you're kind of cute. And so I'd be in a bar polishing some old drunk shoe and he would look down at me and think about his kids he's abandoned at home and give me great big tips because a little six-year-old polishing shoes in a bar. And then they'd sit me up on the bar. They'd put a big old cigar in my mouth, pour me a shot of Jack Daniels. I'd slam it down and they'd give me a $10 tip. And everybody got a big laugh out of it. I, I'm just, I don't want, I don't want to emphasize, I'm, go, I'm going somewhere very important. By the time I was eight years old, I was, I was in the game. I was regularly by that time smoking marijuana on a regular basis. I was smoking from that point. I, I went on to heroin and acid and just about every kind of drug you can imagine. I was in reform school for three years. By the time I was 15 years old, I spent six years of my life incarcerated. By the time I was 25 years old, I hope you'll still be my friends. I hope you still will love me after this. That was over 40 years ago. But I just want to tell you from where I came from, I came from a neighborhood that there was violence everywhere. There's, there was immorality on every corner. A child could get a hold of hard porn in just about any back, back room of just about any store in the neighborhood. There was all kinds of gang warfare. There's all kinds of death and violence. I don't remember a week of my life when I was in grade school that somebody from my school, now granted, we had 3,500 kids in that school because it was in Chicago, but there was not a week of my childhood where there was not at least one kid that was killed that week or murdered that week or died from a drug overdose that week. That's how I grew up. So when I say there's hope for America, I come in from a perspective that if God could take me out of that environment and send me preaching the gospel around the world and allow me to minister to some of the finest people in the world right here in Bernard Ridge, Kentucky, then I know for a fact that God can save America. I know for a fact that God, God can do a series of miracles to turn this nation around just like he did a series of miracles to turn my life around. But it's going to start right here in the local church. It's not going to be a Jimmy Swagger it's not going to be a Billy Graham. It's not going to be a Benny Hinn. No, this revival is going to be different. It's going to be local church after local church after local church getting on fire and then affecting their king, their communities with the kingdom of God. How many are ready for God to send a revival to turn the United States of America upside right? 
I shared all that for a reason. By the time I got saved, I had been stabbed three times and shot once. I spent three years of my life in Joliet State Penitentiary, one of the worst prisons in the entire United States of America. So if God could save me, God could save America. If God could transform me, God could transform America. Somebody shout hallelujah. Saints of God, I want to give God glory. I'm going to preach a little bit shorter on this end of it, but I want to talk to you that it's never too late for God to turn a nation around. By the time I got saved, I destroyed almost all the brain cells I had through drugs and alcohol. I had destroyed my life, but God in his mercy, God in his grace saved me, delivered me, restored me, made me whole again, called me to preach his glorious gospel to the four corners of the world. Don't tell me God doesn't do miracles. Don't tell me God can't transform lives. Don't tell me your child's so far from God that God can't save them. This is the revival. This is the time for them to come to God. Now I know it's a little hooky joiky, but I know that I know it's a word from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It's kind of hoiky joiky. Uh, the PowerPoint portion go up there it is. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or, or of wisdom. Now I have God had me sit down the last month, the month of December, and I wrote a series of 21 messages in 18 days. And I search and I dig when I write a message. And God said, for an hour such as this, for our nation right now, for the churches that are hungry, that for a move of God, to turn this a supernatural move of God. So these messages are brand new. These messages are right for God, for right now, to the United States of America, for the future of our country, for our children and our grandchildren. And I know I'm not a good preacher. I know I'm average at best. But please take this as a word from God. Take it as God speaking to your spirit directly from heaven that it's not too late. But, but we're getting very close. We've got to move now because we have a space. We have a space. He says, and I, my brethren... This is the Apostle Paul, the theologian's theologian. He's the one that theologians study. And I, my brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. He was fully trained in the wisdom and all the knowledge of the Roman Empire. He was a Pharisee's Pharisee. So this man had great knowledge of the Old Testament. But all that aside... And he did write some tremendous messages as we read in the word of God. He said, I did not, I came not with you with excellency of speech or of wisdom. I'm sure there was wisdom in what he said. But he said, I wasn't depending on that. And I wasn't depending on my ability to speak. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. I'm not declaring unto you my education I'm not declaring unto you my, my, my degrees. I'm declaring unto you the testimony of God. How many are glad that God has a testimony? And his testimony is for you and for me tonight. Now notice the next voice. I know it's hoiky joiky. For I determined not. When I came to Bernard Ridge this week, listen to my heart. I love you, your family. I determined not to know anything. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him, and him crucified. I've come to preach to you Jesus and the finished work of the cross of Calvary because the finished work of the cross of Calvary can save you, it can deliver you, it can heal you, it can set you on fire, it can save your marriage. Oh, come on, somebody, it can save your business. It can get you out of bankruptcy. It can give you peace and joy. Notice first number three. How many ask God for this revival that God would give me a fresh word for you? How many ask God that God would speak directly to your heart? Well, here it is. And then Paul, the theologian's theologian that wrote most of the New Testament, that started most of the New Testament church. This was one of the greatest men in the whole word of God. But he said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. 
I recognize the weakness of my flesh, that these gifts are an earthen vessel, and the word earthen means dirt. He said, and, and I came with fear, not fear of God, not, not fear of you, but fear of missing the word from God for you. Because God confirms his word with signs following. Saints of God, these are not mere words out of Brother John's mouth. These are word. This is the word of God for you. And God will confirm. There's nothing too hard for God. I shared just a little bit of my testimony, not because I'm proud of it. I, who would want to talk about the things I just had to talk about? But I wanted you to know there's nobody so far from God that God can't save. There's no problem in your life that God can't fix. There's no mistake you've made that God can't turn around. Somebody shout hallelujah. He said, I was with you in weakness. In, I didn't count on my physical strength. I was weak with, weak with you in fear that I could somehow miss the simplicity of the gospel. And in much trembling, as I prepared to serve you, I always wondered, Brother Cornette, I have confidence in God. I have confidence in God's anointing. And I would study and I would pray. And I did everything I knew to do to prepare myself. But when I would go to church, sometimes I would almost shake uncontrollably. So I would begin to sweat profusely. And I know what that sweat is. That's when you're really scared about something. And I wondered what it was. And I realized it was the gravity of what I was about to do. It was the gravity that I was about to step behind God's sacred pulpit and be the spokesman for God and that I was going to be held to a higher account because I'm speaking for the Lord here. So with much trembling, I came to you. Notice verse 4. Everybody raise your hand and say, God is speaking to us right now. Please raise your hand and say, God is speaking to us right now. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. We should strive to always preach the best we can. We should always constantly be improving our vernacular, improving everything we can academically. But when we get up here, academic alone ain't going to do it. Ability to speak ain't going to do it. We're going to have to have that supernatural hand of God on our lives. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. Oh, but I pray desperately, God, let it be in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it can turn this nation back to God. A demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit from border to border, coast to coast. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, I want to just share with you, this would probably be the longest message of the entire revival. Most of them are fairly short by my standard. And but, but this is the foundation. This is what God wants to accomplish in us and through us, not just for ourselves, but for our nation, for everyone we love. It has to start somewhere. Why not here? It has to start sometime. Why not now? It has to start with somebody. Why not us? And notice the next verse. That your faith. See, I don't come to you in my abilities or my talents, but I'll come in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, saints of God, I learned something. When I got saved, I was such a bad, terrible criminal by that time. I had been living a godless life all my entire life. I'm in my early 20s. And, and, and I didn't realize it, but a couple of weeks before I got saved, people were trying to testify to, to me about Jesus. And I thought they were talking about some other sinner. I didn't even realize, I was so ignorant, I didn't realize they were talking about me. And buddy, I could argue with them. I knew nothing about the Bible, but I could argue with them, and I can argue with them, and they could never convince me with words alone, to give my life to Jesus. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. If someone's smart enough, if someone has the ability to talk good, they can talk just about anybody out of anything they know in their head. 
But if you've had a supernatural encounter with God, there's nobody, no words can talk you out of what you know happened to you. I know I gave my life to Jesus Christ 41 years ago, and instantly I was no longer a drug addict. I was no longer an alcoholic. I should still be in prison right now, but all those charges were dropped. Why? Because I had a supernatural encounter of a heavenly kind, and that's what this week is about, saints. How many want that to happen in your life? How many are willing to give God just the next six nights of your life to have a supernatural encounter of a heavenly kind? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? That your faith should stand in the wisdom, should not stand in the wisdom of men. Paul could have got by with his smarts as far as giving a lecture as far as speaking academically, he could have spoken at any university of the day. But he said that doesn't work in a transformation of lives. That I come to you in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. So that your faith is not in a mere man. But your faith is in God and the power of God that has no limitations. I'm thankful that you support my ministry. I'm thankful that you love me. I'm thankful that you respond and you're attentive. But I know that your faith isn't in John. Your faith is in God and the God I'm talking about and the anointing of God that flows through my life. That your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I said what I said earlier to you to talk to you about Corinth at the time. Corinth was one of the most ungodly cities ever to exist on the planet Earth. In Corinth, they, they celebrated all kinds of terrible paganisms. If you were walking down the streets of Corinth back in Paul's day, you would be see gigantic, I mean monumental, statues to false idols, statues to false gods, statues of idols, of vulgarity that because there's ladies and children in this room I can't even tell you but just statues of parts of the human anatomy they considered that huge statues of it it was full of all kinds of demonic worship they sacrificed babies they did all kinds of awful awful paganistic things and that's where Paul is talking about when it get, that's where Paul was when he said, that's how I reached the Corinthians. They were godless. They were pagans. They were heathens. They were caught up in all kinds of drug and alcohol abuse. They had no moral structure whatsoever. And I knew if I was going to reach people of that nature, if I was going to touch lives that were that far away from God, I couldn't do it with just preaching alone. I couldn't do it with just good words and good music. We had to have a supernatural intervention of God. I believe that this revival this week, as we hunger after God, how many believe it with me? We're going to have a supernatural encounter with God. Our kids need it. We need it. We all need it. Now, saints of God, that's where Paul was preaching this. And you know that the, the church in Corinth was the first super or mega church of its day. So Paul went to the worst city in existence at the time, preached the way he preached with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost and managed to plant the first mega church of its day without a cell phone, without a computer, without the internet. And he, because there's something, let me tell you something, saints. There's something about that demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost gets a hold of your life, you ain't never the same again. And you know what needs to happen tonight? This first service this morning we need to let the Holy Ghost get a hold of us afresh and anew we need to let the Holy Ghost set us on fire and we need to let the Holy Ghost give us back our shout give us back our dance give us back our praise come on somebody does somebody remember a time in your life when you were closer to the Holy Ghost than you are right now do you remember a time in your life when you were more on fire for God than you are right now do you remember a time in your life when you were more passionate to pray more passionate to worship than you are right now. Don't write it off that you were a fanatic. Don't write it off that you just got overboard in your walk with God. No, you were on fire by the power of the Holy Ghost and it was a demonstration of God's power. And if we want to see our family safe, we've got to have a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. we got to have it. 
Because most of us consider today and say that's the reason we're saved. Almost every one of us in this room can remember when God got a hold of us. Your circumstance was different, and your circumstance was different, and your circumstance was different. But you can remember when God got a hold of you, and you were never the same again. Oh, you may have had some hiccups in the road. You may have fell a few times, but you got back up. Why? Because there was something inside of you that refused to let you stay down, and that was the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not coming to you now in a demonstration of the enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. Are you hungry? America needs Holy Ghost revival. Do you know something about your country that most people don't know? You're not going to hear it on CNN. You're not even going to hear it on Fox, probably. Do you know America is the only nation in the world Israel was God's chosen people. God picked them as a nation. But America is the only nation in the history of this planet that was birthed because of people were wanted God. They picked God and they wanted a nation where they could serve God with liberty. And America was birthed by a people that wanted God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And God, we're not like other countries. We're nothing like them. We were born out of a hunger for God to be a nation in God we trust, to be a nation that served the Lord. And we, this nation was birthed by people that wanted the freedom to serve God. I know this is hoiky-joiky, but bear with me. I do not come to you enticing words in men's wisdom. Several years ago, going back 40 years in the ministry, I was green in the grass. I couldn't even read at the time. Someone had to read my scriptures, and I would preach whatever they read. Now listen to me. I was in this little bitty church, about as many people that are in this front three or four seats over here at Rose, maybe 10, 15 people counting the pastor and his wife and their son. And I got up and preached. You ever have a, I don't know how many of you have ever preached. How many of you ever preached or taught or sang? Let me see your hands. Do you ever have a night where, man, you knew it didn't flow? Do you ever have a time where you just knew you laid an egg? And it about bad as it could get. And you wish you could just crawl on the carpet and not have to look at anybody and just start over the next service. I've had a few of those. Don't say I'm having one now. <laughs> but, but I was in this service and I came in a little bit late like th this morning and I didn't see it, but they carried a woman in and sat her down in the back row. I didn't see that. She looked pretty normal from about here up. And I'm preaching away. And buddy, Pastor, Pastor Cornette, I know you feel for me. It was one of them nights I couldn't get my words straight, couldn't get my thoughts straight. I got done preaching, and I don't even know what I was preaching. But when I gave, and, and because I preached so horrible, Joe, I, I preached so bad, I gave the altar call, and it was not that I didn't love God, but I figured nobody would respond. It was so bad. I said, well, if you want to come on up here, come on. <laughs> it, was that, it was that bad. I'm serious. It was that bad. And then, you know, because it was bad, most nobody moved. But all of a sudden, a lady let out one of those screams, you know, that rips the paint off the walls, makes your hair stand up. <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, this skinny little woman got up and went, wobbling to the owl. And when she got to the owl, she just started throwing her arms and her legs wildly. And I noticed she had a body brace on. She had leg braces, metal leg braces on, arm braces on. She started kicking her arms and flinging her arms, braces flying everywhere. She tore off the back brace off her back. She had MS. It had completely destroyed her complete body. And I saw her dancing 
in the aisle that night when her son had to carry into the service because she could no longer walk. You may not believe this, but I'm telling you before the Lord, the next day that girl's legs were twice as big as they were the night before because I do not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration. Let me tell you something. When a person has a divine encounter with God, when God does something supernatural in your life, the devil can't talk you out of it. When God starts moving in a supernatural way, there's not enough devils in hell to keep you sitting in your seat. When God is healing the sick and setting people, I'm telling you right now, saints of God, that's what we need. We need what the first century church had in the 21st century. Somebody shout hallelujah. Then my mind went back to a service in Fort Meade, Florida. John Airwood, personal friend of Pastor and I both. The reason I'm here, besides God, is Brother Airwood recommended me to your pastor. But we were in revival in Fort Meade, Florida. The Holy Ghost got to moving. People, you know, you know what happens when the Holy, the Holy Ghost gets to moving. The altar flooded with people. People getting saved over here. People getting the Holy Ghost over here. Marriage has been put back together over here. People being delivered from drugs over there. Cancer being brought out, cast out of people's bodies over here. People just getting healed. Blind people getting their eyes. A blind person got their eyesight back. And that revival got so strong that the building literally was shaking visibly. And during church, the building was literally shaking visibly where you could see the walls moving. Because the power of God was so great. So what did we do? We set up a tent. And 18 weeks later, we were still in a revival. And 476 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Why? Because there was a demonstration. So you figure after an 18-week revival in one church, you ain't never going to have a long revival in that church again. Because they did 18 weeks once, it's kind of hard to motivate people to call a long revival in the future. But man, some of the greatest miracles happened in the latter part of it, the last couple of weeks, because faith built, expectation built. Now, bear with me. I, I know it's hooky joiky, but bear with me because this is so important. So I go back in 1990, and we were, this desert storm was just about to take place. And there was a rally in downtown Fort Meade for the parents and grandparents and wives to gather and pray for their husbands. At that time, there wasn't a lot of ladies in the military for their safety in Desert Storm. We were about to evade the next day or two. And we gathered downtown. I'm ashamed this was not one of my better moments. I was in my early 30s, so that was my excuse. Youth and the ignorance of youth, I guess. And, and they're there, my, my dad fought at Normandy. My, my, my dad had three Purple Hearts. My brother was a POW in Vietnam. So I was there to, to help and speak to this group of people. And I didn't get to speak because as we were worshiping God, some person pulled out a flag, poured lighter fluid on it, and I ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I know what's about to happen. And um, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I clocked them. I thought about my dad being shot up at Normandy and the tens of thousands, eight million Allied soldiers who died in World War II. I thought of my brother being tortured in Vietnam without mercy. And our boys are about to walk into war, and this guy's going to light a flag on fire. I didn't sin because I didn't think about it. I didn't say, should I or shouldn't I? I just popped them before I knew what I was doing. And I clocked them, got arrested. He got arrested. I'm sitting in jail. My ministry's over. Revival's over. Might as well go home. I done clocked somebody and the revival ain't even started yet. Don't worry, I ain't gonna clock nobody. And I'm not proud of this. But I clocked a dude and the sheriff walked back there from Polk County, Florida and said, son, to the other guy, you can drop charges against this guy. 
and we'll drop charges against you for trying to burn a flag. And then he said, Brother John, if you'll drop charges against him for trying to burn a flag, we'll just let both of you go home. So we, of course, we agreed. He went out one door, I went out the other door. Nobody spoke to me when they picked me up. Brother, Brother Cornette, I walked to church, going to be the first service of the revival. This rally was on Saturday night. I know I'm doomed. I know I'm doomed. Everybody knows I clocked somebody. Everybody knows I spent the night in jail. Revival's over. And I walked into church. True story. And, the, and, and they had a platform about this size. And it was just covered with huge bouquets of flowers. And I thought I, I won the Kentucky Derby or something. And I walked by and, and I thought there was going to be a wedding or something. And my name was on all of them. And I said, oh, I'm surely dead now because now they're sending flowers already for my funeral. But little did I know at that rally, there was Methodist people there. There was Baptist people there. There were Catholic people there. There were Presbyterians there. And when they saw me clock that guy and they were thinking about their sons about to be shipped out, they thought I was the best evangelist ever sent to Fort Meade, Florida in their mind. So that Sunday, we had the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Catholics with the Church of God. And I don't know who's who. I thought the church just grew a lot. I didn't know. And I gave an altar call, and that altar just flooded with people. I mean, just, just flood. I mean, just flooded with people. So I start laying hands on folks, and by God's divine glory and God for his glory, people just started falling out like crazy everywhere. Boom, 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 boom. Everywhere. And when they hit the floor, they were talking in tongues. Little did I know, that guy was a Baptist banker. That was a Methodist lawyer. This one was a Catholic priest. And then all these different people were falling out under the power of God and speaking in tongues because I don't come to you today with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power. Let, we don't know what God's going to do. That revival went five weeks and we had 270 something people saved. I'm doing this real fast, but how many want God to send an, an earth shaking event this week? I, I was in Garden City, Georgia. Terry Fairbanks was the pastor. We were having, we we're worshiping the Holy Ghost, filled the house. I saw the glory cloud come in. People started running around the church. Then they started running outside the church. Then they started running up and down Moffat Highway, Highway 98, which is the main road, goes all the way up through Mobile, Alabama, all the way down through Florida, running up and down the road. That pastor kept the baptism filled at all times because he baptized new converts. As soon as they got saved, they came running back in. One guy did a header right into the baptism, just dived in head first. There's people running, hollering, screaming, just carrying on all over the place. And saints of God, in that revival, they opened the door to the front door of that church. And across the park was where all the game bangers were and all the prostitutes were and all the drug pushers were. You could smell the pot coming in the room from outside the church. And saints of God, people started walking in the back door of that church and coming to the altar and giving their lives to Jesus Christ. There was a lady came to the altar and she opened up her coat and she was a stripper and she was dressed to go do her job, which means she was barely dressed. She gave her life to Jesus. Jesus Christ got baptized in the Holy Ghost and is preaching the gospel in Arkansas right now. Why? Because I do not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration. Let's give the Holy Ghost a chance. I was in, I was in Seville, Vero, Tennessee, where the home for the children is. And one of the largest churches in Knoxville, big church in Knoxville, real big church in Knoxville. And like some big churches, they, they're spirit filled, but you wouldn't know it all the time. And, and, and everybody was dressed to the nines, which is cool. Cool to be dressed to the nines. They all dressed to the nines. This choir, and they all come out in white, beautiful gowns. I, I'm, I'm talking, this, this church had it. And they sang pretty good. 
And the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. And I don't, I, I don't, I've never done it before or since. And I just started running up to people, laying hands on them in the choir. While they were singing. Sure enough, sure enough, boom, 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 boom. They started hitting the floor. The first woman I laid hands on was the pastor's wife who had cancer. And she got laid out on the floor. She got up off the floor, went back to be tested. She didn't have cancer anymore. Brother McGinnis's wife was healed. Now listen to this. I laid hands on person after person. This is God, not me. God just flowing through a man, just God flowing through a man. And person, every single one of the choir members got laid out. Next thing you know, that whole church was shouting and carrying out. And a move of God, it broke out. And we went several weeks in revival there. Oh, saints of God, I do not come to you in enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. And one more thing, and I'm going to close. I was preaching for Dr. T.L. Lowry. My son's 32, he was seven. And my daughter is five years, 37, and she was 12. And Dr. Lyre, there was like 2,000 people in attendance at that service, and they all wanted to be prayed for, all of them. Well, yeah, you, you can't pray, lay hands on 2,000 people. So you know what Dr. Lowry did? He went and got my daughter, 12 years old. Put her over here. Got my son, seven years old. Put him over here. He said, don't worry, son. There's a transference of anointing from you to them. When Dr. Lowry talks, <laughs> and these hundreds of people lined up for me, my son, my, my son's seven, sister pastor. And he, <laughs> he laid his hands on people's heads. And they started falling out on the power of God. And every time they fall out on the power of God, I'm like, my son's seven. And you go. And then he laid a hand on another one, fell out on the power of God. And my son would go. And my daughter was laying hands 12 years old on people, and they're falling out on the power of God. And there was testimony after testimony of healings and deliverances of miracles. And people were getting saved. A 12-year-old, a 7-year-old, their daddy preaching for Dr. T. L. Lowry, the evangelist of all evangelists. What am I trying to say? What happened that night in Washington, D.C. can happen in Washington, D.C. right now. If God can move to, through a 7-year-old and a 12-year-old, I believe God can move through preachers, men and women of God in Washington, D.C. right now and turn that city upside. I believe I believe, I believe. So now I'm going to read to you real fast and close. Are you ready to have a revival of a supernatural kind? Are you ready for me to do the best I can to preach? But it's not going to be dependent on that. I do not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. Are you ready for a supernatural Holy Ghost revival? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You may have had great revival experiences as I shared with you tonight, and I just sh shared the cream of the crop, but saints of God, you have not seen, you have not heard, you have not read about a revival like God wants to give this week in this church. Are you ready for the greatest revival that you've ever seen? Are you ready for a revival where your body gets healed? Are you ready for a revival where cancer is cast? out? Are you ready for revival where your loved ones get saved? Are you ready for revival, for a revival to break out over the entire state of Kentucky then spread northeast to oh come on somebody. Are you ready for Holy Ghost revival? Are you ready for the greatest move of God? Oh come on stand to your feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise and a shout of triumph. Oh clap your hands all oh, you people. Now what I'm going to do, now I'm going to lay hands on you as the Holy Ghost directs me, but I'm going to ask everybody standing to your feet, I want you to run to this altar, and I'm going to ask you from the Holy Ghost, I'm following instruction of the Holy Ghost.
I'll ask you to run to this altar with your hands raised in the air and say, Lord, please send Holy Ghost revival. Let me be a vessel you can use this week. Run this all. Please hurry. I'm telling you, your family depends on it. Our country depends on it. Your life depends on it. Run to this altar right now. Everybody come. Raise your hands right now. I'm going to pray for many of you. I'm going to pray for many of you, and I believe you're going to get healed. Hurry. Come out of that pew quickly, 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 quickly. Hurry, 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 hurry. The first thing we got to do is we got to get a mind change. I've read and studied great revivals throughout history, Brother Cornett. And the first thing you discover when you read these books about revival and the great revivals of the past, there was no clocks. There was no time zone. Many times they would have church till the sun came up in the morning. Many times they would have church for hours and hours and hours. But when they got done having church, God did miracles in their midst. Young people, I'm here to tell you, we serve the God of the Bible. He still saves. He still delivers. He still heals. He still baptizes in the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you, young people, he's better than anything this world's got to offer. Come on, some of you young people, come up here right now and raise your hands in this altar. This altar's for you too. God wants a group of young people on fire in the Holy Ghost. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Are you thirsty for the Holy Ghost? Do you want to have an encounter with the Jesus in the Bible? Do you want to have an encounter with the Jesus in the Bible? Let me share a quick story and then we'll pray for you. There was a little boy, and he was reading his Bible, and he said to his daddy, this true story, his daddy was a great preacher. He said, he said, Daddy, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Jesus healed the sick. His daddy was very impressed with his five, five-year-old said that to him. Five years old. And you know what daddy said? Well, son. Many grown-ups don't know that. Would you like Jesus, listen to me, would you like Jesus to come into your heart? You know what the little boy's reply was to his daddy? He said, Daddy, when I can get Jesus out of the Bible, he's welcome to live in my heart. This week, Jesus is coming out of the Bible. And he's going to manifest in this house. And you're going to leave different than you came in. If you need a miracle right now, as you praise God for revival. Everybody out there, if you're not in the altar, raise your hands and begin to praise God for a revival. For a Holy Ghost revival of a heavenly kind. Do you need God to touch your marriage? Do you need God to touch your mind? Do you need God to touch your finance? Do you need God to touch? How many would like to see God put a curse on this COVID-19 and it be wiped off the planet? How many know that God can heal COVID-19? How many believe God can wipe it out with just one sweep of his mighty hand while you're in this altar this morning? Not one person is, every person in this altar is vital. Every person in this altar is important. Every person in this altar is of life-changing consequences. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm not bringing attention to the first lady. I, I'm assuming the church knows some of the... Th I'm not bringing attention to her, but since I've been told, I've not been able to just go to bed without praying for her, wake up praying for her, dream about praying for her in the name of Jesus. She will not have cancer. I speak healing to her body right now. I do not come with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. So she be healed in the name of Jesus. Be made whole in the name of Jesus. Cancer, get out. Cancer, you have no authority in this body. In the name of Jesus. You need a miracle. You get to this preacher right now. That means if you got to cut across the front, you cut across the front. If you got to cut in line, you cut in line. Be like that woman with the issue of blood. If you got to crawl through the crowd, just get to me. But keep coming right now. Hurry. Keep coming. Hurry. God's moving right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait a second. I do not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost, so that your faith be not in man, but your faith be in God in the word of Yitarabasatarabai. 
Shaturandarabasatai. I want to tell you, woman of God, I did it in Corinth, I did it in Chicago, and I'm going to do it in Bernard Ridge. Yes, I am. I'm the same God, same yesterday, today, and forever. And I change not. Keep those hands in the air. Listen to me, saints. I, bought, I preached from, the, from Corinth because... Corinth was the old it was the New Testament Chicago. Corinth and Chicago were just alike. And if God could do it in Corinth and God did it in Chicago, God can and will do it right here in Bernard Ridge, Kentucky. How many of you believe this? It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You've not seen anything yet. I'm going to open doors that no man can close. I'm going to close doors that no man can open. I will move through you as a mighty vessel of my anointing, of my power, of my grace. You're here this morning. Please, I know time is of essence. But I'm telling you, saints, it's not so I can preach long. I'm going to preach as short as I can every night and communicate and connect. It is because I've studied it and studied it. Azusa Street, Brownsville, Camp Creek, Barney Creek. Time was not even a matter. Time had no bearing whatsoever. They wanted a divine encounter with God and they stayed until they had a divine encounter with God. And when we do that again, we'll get what they got. I know what people say, well, we're more busy today than they were then. No, we're not. We work harder than they did then. No, we don't. We're fortunate. Come here, man of valor. I have not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom. But I have come to you in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost, whose I am, whom I serve. And she told her, but there he is. There he is. There he is. There he is, folks. Glory to God. Hallelujah. As I lay hands on you, make your request known to God. Make your request known to God. You say, well, Brother John, you're praying in tongues. I'm praying a prayer of agreement. I don't know what you're praying, but he knows what you're praying. And I'm praying in agreement with you. In the name of Jesus. Woman of God, step forward quickly in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Be it unto you according to your faith. Shati Korita Rabat. There he is. There. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I've witnessed it. And I use Corinth, Corinthians for a reason. Because Corinthians it was a New Testament city that most is like that most was like our modern cities of America today. Godless shameless, just on the verge of being reprobates. And if it wasn't for the mercy of God, they would be reprobates. But God is a merciful God. Please let me pray for you, because I'm telling you, whatever you pray for, you're going, God's, there's going to be a release of his eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has even entered the heart. Nobody, have you imagined them being saved? Have you imagined being healed? Have you imagined this problem being sound? It'll come when we tarry. It'll come through hunger and thirst. It'll come. Oh, oh God. She quito la bosso turranda la bosso. Hallelujah. 
Can I say something to you? Can I pray for you as a couple, please? The two of you? Yes. You built a beautiful, beautiful, magnificent church here. Magnificent. I wish all of them looked like that. I wish... Every church I went to, people cared about how it looks like you care about this one. But I'm going to tell you something. When God's glory fills this church the way he's going to fill it, this is going to look like a, I don't know how many square foot this is, but a lot of square foot diamond just glowing. There's going to be a glow of God's glory. Yes, yeah, I understand. I understand. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for healing the COVID. I thank you, Lord, for eradicating the COVID. I thank you, Lord, for giving wisdom to men. And they supernaturally came up with a cure in just a, a vaccine in what would take normally years and years. They did it in nine months. That was you, God. That was your mercy. And I pray for my brother right now that that same power that Paul had to have to convert Corinth to you, Lord, the first mega church of the day, I pray would manifest in his life. And I has not seen nor ear heard or into the hearts of man what God has prepared for you. See, this, this, this is not, this, this is, if you want me to touch your shoulder, just tap your shoulder. Listen, this is not a spreader event. Almost all times when you hear about spreader events, it's not people riding. It's Christians having church. How come they ain't talking about a spreading event with the Super Bowl? You know why? Because there's hundreds of millions of dollars involved. That's why. Suddenly, it's not a, you can put 22,000 people in this. That's not a spreader event. But there we have 200 in a beautiful place like this. I'm not being, I'm just being real, folks. I'm not going to take my instruction from people that don't know how to walk in faith. See, faith can, faith operates in the supernatural. Facts operate in the natural. Woman, in the name of Jesus, there it is. Come here. God's moving. Y'all, you're going to be glad you waited. Because God's a healing God. If we ever need a touch from God, we need it today. If America don't turn to God soon, what we're facing in moral decay right now, and I'm a World War II brat, is worse than the threat of Nazi Germany. If we don't turn to God soon, it's got to start here. Woman, I have called you out. Be made whole. Be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For your comfort, I normally carry a, a thing of disinfect I spray my hands with between people, but I feel you feel fairly comfortable with me right now. Father, let me see the hands of somebody that you know needs a miracle. Let me see the hands of somebody you know that is bound by fear and anxiety over this COVID-19, please beg and get him to the house of God tonight. Please, please. The surgeon told, the surgeon told my wife 
that I was within one day of dying from COVID. So I had about as bad as you can get it and live. I'm not making light of it. I had a preacher call me up and said, well, Brother John, this is back in August of last year, so you don't have to worry. And I got tested again for your, in a, a couple months ago, and just for people's sake, because I serve the public. But I want to share some with you. This is so important. He said to me, Brother John, don't you regret going and doing that revival and having to close on Monday night because you caught COVID? I probably caught COVID before I got there. And I said, no, brother, I don't, because three people got saved that morning. And three people getting saved means it's time for me to go to heaven. I'm ready. I'm not a brave man. But I'll tell you one thing. Now, I'm not talking about mass. If you feel mass is important, and I'm not talking about that. You Social distancing, we're doing that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about up here. I'd rather die today fighting than live my life as a coward. America needs the church. America needs the church or we're doomed. The only one that can write this ship now is God. In the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost is here. You might need a couple ushers to help me out here. Some younger men, stronger bodies. Hint, hint. In the name of Jesus. There he is. There he is. There he is. Shut the rat out of us. Let me tell you something. We got, we got some good news for you. Daughter, I'll turn your life around. God plucked me out of obscurity and sent me to the four corners of the world. God will do the same with you. She told us that I was a would somebody raise your hands all across this room and just say, God, please give us a, a mighty move of the Holy Ghost. Raise your hands and say, God, give us a mighty move of the Holy Ghost where we can say that we have not come in enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost where eye has not seen or ear heard or ever hit near the hearts of men what I'm prepared to do. In the name of Jesus, if you hear me cough, I have suffered with sinuses for 20 years. I'm waiting for God to heal me. I know he will. So, d see, don't panic because someone's got a sinus infection. Don't panic because someone's got a cold. I mean, you want to see a room in? You want, you want to get a good seat in the restaurant? You do, do you? Just wear a mask, stand in the middle of that restaurant and cough a couple times. You'll get the best seat in the place. I'm not kidding. I do not come to you. Yeah, he touched you, didn't he? He touched you, didn't he? Shut the I begun a good work and I'll finish it. I'm not coming to you with enticing words of men's wisdom. Young people, I'm coming to you in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. So your faith is not in man, but your faith is in God. You need God faith. Men are frail. Men are weak. We have limitations. God has no limitations. I'm not coming to you, sir, with enticing words of men's wisdom, but much rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. 
in the name of Jesus, God's saying, I want to send the greatest revival that the state of Kentucky has ever seen, and I want to send it right here to Bernard Ridge because you know what to do with it. You've got the experience. You, you've got the knowledge. You, you have the experience in God and how to handle such a move of God. I can't send this just anywhere. <laughs> I have to have rooted Christians, grounded Christians, mature Christians. Keep coming. Son, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. The greatest man of God can pour into you everything that they have, and it's still nothing compared to what God has in his reservoir. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, into the hearts of man. The revival I'm prepared to send. In the name of Jesus. Tonight's going to be a miracle service. How many of you know someone needs a miracle? I beg you, in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, get them here. Don't just invite them. Be here, please. If they walk in and they see you not here, their life will turn right around and walk out. You're the person they want to sit with. You're the one that invited them. I'm telling you, tonight's going to be a miracle service. Tonight's going to be a miracle service. I do not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. There's always going to be a Pentecostal church, you know. There's always going to be a remnant that's Pentecostal, no matter what men try to do. Aren't you glad you got a pastor who's Pentecostal? God, if you can move in Corinth... If you can move in Chicago, you can move in Bernard Ridge. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is going to be like no revival we've ever had. We've always had great revivals, but this is going to be like no revival we've ever had because we've never been in an hour like this. America has to have revival. We must have revival. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, it's not by might nor by power. But by God's secret, eye has not seen, ear heard. Look at that scripture, saints. That's what God wants to do this week. Who's he going to do it for? The hungry. Who's he going to do it for? The thirsty. Who's he going to do it for? The people that are here for him to do it to. If you're not here, as much as God wants to bless you, he can't bless you if you're not here. He confirms his word with signs following. There's nothing that will ever, all the life, I like life feed. It brings more people into the picture, but it won't replace being in the house of God. Hebrews 10, 28, forsake not together together the saints as some do. Even all the more as you see that day approaching. That's the rapture. God knew COVID-19 would be out right before the rapture. He said, forsake not. There'll be a lot of logical reasons. Shoulder head. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. 
Sii tora la la basata la 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 basata. Sotora ta la la basotora ta la bas. Can I say something to you? You need to know, just for your mind's sake. Put your mind at ease. Wear the if you want to wear masks, please by all means. I don't think you don't have faith. Wear masks. I go to Africa on mission trips. There's times I go where in the part of the hospital that's leper county, I wear masks. Uh, so don't misunderstand. But I, I've just got to tell you something, saints. I called the CDC. And I was checking on my follow-up shot. This is true. This is last week. And, I, you know, so because I'm ministering to you, I want to make sure I've done everything in my power to minister to you and be safe. You know what they asked me? This is the CDC out of Washington. They asked me, have you had COVID? Yes. You know what they told me? You're immune. So on one hand, they're telling you you're not immune. On the other hand, they're telling you are immune. On the other hand, we don't know. All I know is I'm covered with the blood. <laughs> I said, all I know is I'm covered with the blood. Amen. And his blood's enough. <laughs> Please don't miss tonight. Please don't miss tonight. Tonight's going to be powerful. Son, in the name of Jesus, it's not by might nor by power, but by God's spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you know how safe I am for your evangelist? They want to use my plasma. I must be pretty safe. <laughs> they want my plasma. I'm the best evangelist you could have right now. <laughs> Cancer. Leave her sister's body now. In the name of Jesus. Cancer. Leave now in the name of Jesus. I evict you in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you're not welcome here anymore in the name of Jesus. Her sister is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You have no authority in God's house. Are there any yet? Did I pray for you, Joe? Did I pray for you, bro? Father God, in the name of Jesus, this man has seen a lot of storms come and go. He's seen the swine flu. He's seen Ebola, Zika, stars. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that by your stripes he's healed, he's protected, his loved ones are saved in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over this church that it is a COVID free zone. If man can build a dome and NBA players can play in that dome and people consider it a COVID free zone because man built a dome, I declare that this church is a COVID free zone because this is your dome, this is your house, you are Lord and people can come here and be delivered and set free. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Give God the praise. Put your hands together. Say it, so be it. In the name of Jesus, we say amen, amen, and may, amen. Praise God. Be back tonight, 630. Hallelujah. I'm going to leave this church open all day. You want to come by and have a season of prayer with the Lord. This is a house of prayer. So, uh, Joyce, when you get finished cleaning and whatever you got to plan to do just leave the front door open lights on 
Uh, we're in revival. Stretch your hand this way. Let me put a shepherd's blessing over you today. May the Lord bless you, cover you, and keep you. May he anoint you by the power of the Holy Ghost. May the demonstration of his power and his might flow through you to others. May God save your loved ones, bring them in, set them free, and deliver them. And may God anoint you with the power of the Holy Ghost in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Fellowship together. We'll see you tonight or in the rapture, one or the other.